हेलो स्टूडेंट्स मैं सेल्फ सचिन अर्जुन गुरुड़े असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम के टी एच एम कॉलेज नासिक इन द प्रीवियस वीडियो वी हैव स्टार्टेड विद द चैप्टर दैट इज मॉर्फोलॉजी ऑफ द जर्नलाइज इंसेक्ट एंड हैव कंप्लीटेड द टॉपिक हेड सेगमेंटेशन एंड रिलेटेड थेरीज नाउ इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू लर्न द इंसेक्ट हेड ओरिएंटेशन एंड द स्केलेटन first of all the orientation of the insect head the orientation of the head with respect to rest of the body varies in insects the glandular appendages constitute collectively along the labrum and hypopharynx a well elaborate feeding apparatus they are forming the position of mouth parts in relation to the body axis differs in different group of insects and according to the what kind of the axis they are making with that of the body axis the uh, the orientation of the insect head is of three types first one is a hypognathous orientation second one is a prognathous head orientation and third one is ophisthorhynchus or it is also referred as ophisthognathous head orientation so let's see one by one first of all the hypognathous head orientation now the hypognathous orientation or the condition with the mouth parts is in a continuous series with that of the legs and is probably the primitive characteristic features now orientation of the head such a kind of the head occurs most commonly in phytophagous uh, species living into the open habitat for example arthropteroid insect now if you see the characteristic feature of this hypognathous orientation this is the body axis and this is the orientation of the head and the mouth parts now if you see the angle between the mouth parts and the body axis is roughly right angle or 90 degree angle means if the mouth parts or the head they are making the 180 uh, uh, 90 degree angle with that of the body axis such a kind of the condition is referred as the hypognathous head orientation so here in this diagram you can see so this is the direction of the head and these are the mouth parts and this is the body axis so they are making a somewhat right angle with that of the body axis with respect to the mouth parts and this is the characteristic feature of the arthropteroid insect such as the grasshopper and the cockroaches then second kind of the orientation is known as the prognathous in prognathous condition mouth parts are pointed in forward and this generally found in the predaceous insect species that actively pursue their prey and in the larvae of particularly of some coleoptera which uses their mandible for the purpose of the burrowing or in the burrowing so if you see the angle the mouth parts they are in the 180 degree angle with that of the body axis means they are in a same angle with that of the body axis hence such a condition is referred as the prognathous condition and this is generally found into the many larvae of the coleoptera and in adult condition they are also found in some predaceous insects or predatory insects so this is about the prognathous condition the next one is the ophisthognathous or the ophisthorhynchus condition in this is a characteristic feature of the group hemiptera in hemiptera elongated proboscis is slopes backward and slopes backward between the foreleg and this is the known as the ophisthorhynchus condition so here in this diagram you can see this is the proboscis and in most of the hymenopteran uh, hemipteran insect this proboscis is generally large during the resting condition into the grooves which is located at a ventral side of the thorax and the abdomen so here the proboscis is making a less than 40 or the 50 degree angle with that of the body axis and such a kind of the condition is referred as the ophisthognathous condition or ophisthorhynchus condition now the mouth parts of all the insects encloses a cavity this cavity is known as the preoral cavity with the mouth at its inner end and the part of preoral cavity encloses a proximal part of the hypopharynx 
and the clypeus is known as a cybarium. Between the hypopharynx and the labium is a small cavity known as a salivarium into which the salivary duct is usually opens. So this is generally the um, pattern of the head orientation and the oral opening is exist among the insect that is hypoglathus, proglathus and ophistorhynchus or it is also referred as the of ophistorhynchus condition. So this is about the orientation of the insect head. The next one is the insect head skeleton. The head of an insect loses its primary segmentation during the post embryonic development. Means the primary segmentation from the external side cannot be visible. So due to the enormous sclerotization, the head becomes a hard skeletal capsule. And the head is a continuously sclerotized capsule with no outward appearance of the segmentation, but it is marked by a number of grooves. So, these are the number of grooves which can easily be recognized on the head of a various insects. Most of these grooves are sulci, marking the lines along which the cuticle is inflated to give increased rigidity. The head bears externally a set of sensory and glathal appendages. Sensory organs include a pair of compound eyes and antennae and there are three or two ocelli in, includes the sensory organs and the glathal appendages they includes a various appendages which are collectively known as the mouth parts which includes the labrum, mandible, maxillae and the labium and hypopharynx. So all these appendages constituted in a glathal appendages which are collectively known as the mouth parts. So as we have already learned into the previous video the head of an generalized insect is totally made up of the six segments and these six segments are the pre-antennal segment, antennal segment, intercalary segment, fourth one is a mandibular, maxillary and the labial. So in this way the head of an generalized insect is made up of total six segments but this segmentation is hardly visible or impossible to recognize from the external side but the head due to the presence of certain grooves or the sulci it is divisible into the different areas and these areas are the first of all the labrum then second one is a clypeus then this one region is known as the fronts now this part is referred as the epipharynx the uppermost undivided part of the ep is known as the vertex then lateral areas are known as the gina after the gina there is the post gina then at the top of the thalamus or the head is the occiput and the post occiput so all these are the different region on the insect head they are separated from one another by the head sutures or the different sutures. The head capsule of a matured insect is differentiated into the several region by the suture and the sutures are nothing but the secondarily developed fine grooves. Although the true nature and the morphological significance of the suture is still uncompletely understood but they are the inflations or merely the external external impressions of the internal stiff cuticular ridges which provides either mechanical support to the cranial wall or either they are providing a space for attachment of the different muscles which are originating from the different appendages belongs to the insect head. So this is about the head sutures. The some workers for example the fairies and matsuda they have taken into account the sutures are intersegmental lines but it is now well established that these structures are the product of sclerotization and except the post occipital suture other have no metameric segmentation 
means though this sulci they are responsible for dividing the areas of the insect head into the different parts but these are not exactly the segments of the insect head hence they are not having any uh, significance of the metamerism the common sutures on the insect head are as follows the first one is a clypeolabral suture now this clypeolabral suture present at the lower margin of the clypeus so this region is referred as a clypeus so this is the lower margin of the clypeus and at the lower margin of the clypeus whatever suture is exist that is referred as the clypeolabral suture and the labrum is hanging down from this suture at the distal portion so this is a labrum which is hangs to that clypeolabral suture it bears a prominent ridge from the internal side the ridge possesses an apodems at the center and these apodems are provides an insertion to the anterior retractor muscles of the labrum so this anterior retractor muscles are coming from the labrum which are concerned with a certain movement of the labrum and these muscles are going to lodge into the apodems which are formed by the internal ridge of this clypeolabral suture so in this diagram here you can able to recognize the labrum and this one is a clypeus so in between the clypeus and labrum so this suture is referred as a clypeolabral suture so this is about the first clypeolabral suture then second one the clypeofrontal suture now clypeofrontal suture is lies in the clypeus and the frons so it is also referred as the epistomal suture epi means upon and stoma means mouth opening so this suture is present above the mouth opening hence it is also referred as the epistomal suture so it occurs between the clypeus and frons and it bears a laterally a small pit like structures and these pits are known as anterior tentorial pits so in this diagram you can <coughs> see the small pits are there so these two pits they are referred as the anterior tentorial pit which are the part of the tentorium which is the endoskeleton or the endocapsule of the insect head it is internally bears a strong inflations and these inflations strengthen the lower part of the head against the stretching of the mandible now this suture provides a strength to the head capsule particularly it is necessary when the mandibles are uh, providing a grinding action and hence this suture is responsible for providing the inflation and that inflation strengthen the lower part of the head against the stretching of that mandible so this is the clypeofrontal suture the next one is a epicranial suture now this epicranial suture is actually the composite suture and it appears in the form of inverted y shape it is known as a composite suture because is made up of a further two parts of the suture and it is lies above on the facial region of most of the insects the stem of this composite epicranial suture is referred as the coronal suture and the two lateral arms of that inverted y these are referred as the frontal suture the epicranial suture is partially or even completely reduced in some insects it is totally lacking from the head of a pteropod means this is the characteristic features of only the pterygoat insect while a pterygoat insect they are generally lacking such a kind of the epicranial suture now according to the snodgrass and dewport they have stated that the epicranial suture represent merely the lines of weakness and can be said in a true sense as the ecodysial suture why ecodysial suture because they have noted that whatever process of ecodysis is there that ecodysis is start from this suture whatever integument is held in this suture they are going to broke first of all at the start of molting and then after the old exigua or old cuticle is generally cast off as the process of molting or ecodysis it starts from this 
epicranial suture hence it is also referred as the ecodiacal suture now it does not bears a skeletal ridge on the inner surface and therefore does not provide either site of muscle attachment or mechanical support to the head capsule means epicranial suture internally do not possesses any kind of the ridges apodems hence there is no space for innervation of the muscles or lodging the muscles no, nor they are not providing any kind of the mechanical support to the head capsule so this is about the epicranial suture so in this diagram here you can see the uh, epicranial suture the uh, two arms or lateral arms of this and here in this diagram also so these are the lateral arms of that epicranial suture and this one is a stem which is known as the coronal suture the next one is the occipital suture the occipital suture is a horse shoe shaped or inverted u shaped suture and is well evident on the posterior part of the head of the arthropteroid insects so this suture here you can see so this is referred as the occipital suture now it starts from the posterior articulation of the mandible so this is a mandible and this is a posterior articulation site it start from that posterior articulation of the mandible on the either side and both the arms these both the arms running over a uh, long distance and they are joined one above the uh, one another the of above the occipital foramen so this is the occipital foramen so this is the occipital foramen this is a posterior part or um, posterior articulation site of the mandible and from this posterior articulation the occipital suture are arises and it runs along a long distance and finally here it joins on just above the occipital foramen now it separates the genal part from that of the post gena so from lateral side so this part is referred as a gena and this one is referred as a post gena now this occipital suture is responsible for dividing a gena from that of the post gena it also differentiates the vertex from that occiput in posterior region of the head so this one is a vertex or undivided portion of the uh, upper portion of the head is referred as the vertex so that vertex is also differentiated uh, by this suture it forms an internal ridges strengthening the posterior epicranial wall so this is posterior epicranial wall is strengthened by this kind of the occipital suture so this is about the occipital suture now this occipital suture is well evident into the arthropteroid insect here you can see the occipital suture so this is part undivided part is known as the vertex the next one is a post occipital suture a post occipital suture embraces the occipital foramen magnum from the dorsal and lateral side so this is occipital foramen magnum and from the lateral side as well as from dorsal side it is going to cover so this part or this suture is referred as the uh, post uh, occipital suture so each end of the suture merges into the hypostomal suture so this one is a hypostomal suture and this one is a post occipital suture so each arm from the either side it merges into the hypostomal suture from the ventral region so this site is well defined due to the presence of posterior tentorial pit so here a small black spot is there so this is actually the posterior tentorial pit as we have uh, already seen into the epistomal suture there is a anterior tentorial pit as at the anterior side similarly the at posterior end there is a small pit which is known as a posterior tentorial pit this posterior tentorial pit is always lies on the post occipital suture it possesses internally a strong epidomal ridges the post occipital ridge that ridge is known as a post occipital ridge it provides a site for attachment of the prothoracic muscles which moves a pair of ventrolateral condyle the neck membrane is firmly attached to this ridge and the condyle articulates with the neck sclerite it is the only suture among all 
having a metameric significance because so if you see this one is a maxillary and this one is a uh, labium or the uh, labial bulb and so this post occipital suture is responsible for demarcating the maxillary segment from that of the labial segment hence this post occipital suture is the single alone suture which has the metameric significance so this is about the post occipital suture again this post occipital suture is well recognized among the orthopteroid insect the next one is a frontogenal suture now this frontogenal suture is also referred as a subocular suture sub in the sense it is just near to the um eyes or often it is joined to the ocular suture which is the suture of the compound eye now it develops on each lateral region of the insect head it starts from the junction of the clypeo frontal suture and the subgenal suture now this one is a subgenal suture and this one is a clypeo frontal suture which arises at the juncture this is a juncture of the this is epistomal suture and this one is a subgenal suture so it arises from the junction of these two suture it terminates in the close vicinity of a lower margin of each compound eyes and it is again well evident into the orthopteroid insects so this is referred as the frontogenal suture here you can see so this one is a frontogenal suture now this suture is responsible for separating the frons from that of the gena the frons is a frontal region and this one is a lateral region known as a gena so this suture frontogenal suture is separates the frons from that of the gena so this is about the frontogenal suture the next one is a subgenal suture now this one is a subgenal suture or you can see so this one is whole the subgenal suture the this suture occurs on the lateral sides of the insect head lateral side of the insect head each suture joins the posterior temporal pit so this one is a posterior temporal pit from the uh, same side so each suture is again divisible into the two parts so this sub uh, su uh, genal suture is divisible in two parts the one part of the subgenal suture is known as a hypostomal suture so this one is a hypostomal suture the hypostomal suture is runs from the posterior temporal pit up to the posterior articulation of the mandible so this is the posterior articulation of the mandible and this one is a posterior temporal pit so the area lies between the posterior temporal pit and the posterior articulation of the mandible is known as the hypostomal suture and the other part of the subgenal suture is called as a pleurostomal suture and this pleurostomal suture arches over the mandible and finally joins to the frontoclypeal and the frontogenal suture just above the articulation of the mandible so this part is known as a pleurostomal suture and this pleurostomal suture is joins with that of the epistomal suture or it is also referred as a clypeo frontal suture in the front side so internally the subgenal suture forms a submarginal submarginal subgenal ridges and the subgenal suture strengthens the cranial wall along the lines of attachment of the gnathal appendages so this is about the subgenal suture now this is again a one can say the composite suture is further composed of the two parts the hypostomal suture and the pleurostomal suture so this is about the subgenal suture the next one is a ocular suture so these sutures are the annular grooves which are located around the compound eyes so here you can see so these are a somewhat annular grooves which are encircling the whole compound eyes in case of insect in they forms the skeletal ridges internally which gives a some sort of the muscles attachment for the internal organs and lies into the insect head so this is the ocular suture the next one or the last one is the antennal suture the marginal depression depressed ring around the antennal socket so this is the antennal socket and the suture 
which is going to encircle this antennal socket is referred as the antennal suture. Now, each suture gives internally a submarginal ridge. The submarginal ridge in large number of insects bears a pivot like process and that pivot like process is referred as the antennae fur and this antennae fur is very important which provides the articulation to the antenna so that the this antennae fur is responsible for articulating the distal or uh, basal segment of the antennae into the antennal socket so this suture is referred as the antennal suture so these are the different kinds of the sutures which are recognized on the insect head so let's take a quick summary of what kind of the suture we have uh, learned just now so first suture is referred as a clypeo labrum suture which lies in between the clypeus and the labrum it is lies at a posterior boundary of the clypeus from which labrum is generally hangs from distal side then second suture is referred as the clypeo frontal suture which separating the clypeus from that of the frons it is also referred as a epistomal suture and the characteristic feature of this suture is that it bears a anterior tentoral uh, pits the next suture is known as the epicranial suture this epicranial suture is a composite inverted y shaped suture the base of that y is referred as a coronal suture while the two lateral arms are referred as the frontal suture as the ecdysis the process of molting is start from this suture hence it is also referred as the ecdysial suture the next suture is a occipital suture this occipital suture is lies between the uh, gena and the post gena and this is uh, uh, responsible for separating the gena from that of the post gena and it is uh, well defined into the orthopteroid insect is u shape then post occipital suture a post occipital suture is lies between the occiput and the post occiput it is marked with a posterior tentorial pit and this is the only single suture which having a metameric significance then next one is a frontogenal suture and this one is a frontogenal suture separating the frons from that of the gena it is also referred as a subocular suture the next one is a subgenal suture so this one is a subgenal suture so this subgenal suture is again made up of the two that is the hypostomal suture hypostomal suture and the pleurostomal suture the next one is a ocular suture ocular suture is lies or encircle the compound eyes in case of the insects and the last one is a antennal suture which is uh, <clears throat> present around the antennal sockets so this is about the different kinds of the sutures present on the insect head thank you thank you very much